And so we did a poll uh, in an all-church gathering. We had 1,600 of our people there for a, a Monday night meeting just to say, you know, we're going to talk about this and where the denomination is going. And, and uh, I'm committed to being a church for people who are more traditional on marriage and people who are more inclusive on marriage. And so, uh, but let's see where you're at. And we surveyed the people and it was, I'm making this up, but it's not far off from this. I had 3% of the people who were progressive and said, I'm going to leave. I, I, don't, I can't stay in a church where everybody doesn't hold the same view that I hold. That was 3%. Mm. I had 3% who said, I'm traditional in marriage, and I can't stay in a church that's not going to hold my view of, uh, you know, not uphold my view. Then we had, so that's 6%. Then we had 73% who said, I'm more progressive on marriage, but I understand why my friends have more traditional views, and I want to be in a church with them. And 23% of our people said, I'm more traditional on marriage, but I understand why some are more progressive and I want to be in a church with them. And so what we found was that 90 some percent of the people said, I'm okay being in a church with people different. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I'm so glad you joined us. And if you're brand new, hey, make sure you subscribe. And uh, we also have audio versions of this too. So if you're on the go and you want to listen wherever you listen to your podcast, look for the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. Hey, today we sit down with Adam Hamilton. We're going to talk about some very sensitive and nuanced issues. So if you're leaving a comment, make sure you remember that. These are real people. We're trying to do a good job here of bringing a civil dialogue to complicated subjects. We're going to talk about denomination divorce. We're going to talk about mainline uh, and evangelical. We're going to talk about how to sensitively approach the LGBTQ plus issue and a whole lot more. So please stay tuned. It's going to be a great episode. And today's episode is brought to you by Subsplash and Church.Tech. So Subsplash has 17,000 churches who turn to them to do discipleship in a hybrid reality. So if you want a robust digital solution for your church, you can get $500 off when you go to subsplash.com slash carry. And pastors, did you know Easter is almost here already? Well, what if the push of one button allows you to turn your Easter message into small group guides with questions, into social media posts, and a whole lot more? There's so much you can do with trusted AI through church.tech. Check it out by going to church.tech. And now, my conversation with Adam Hamilton. Adam, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Carrie. It's been a while. It's good to be back. You're yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're one of the OGs. Candid. Yeah, you, you, you have really done amazing things over these last, uh, how, long, how many years has it been since you've been on? You know, the podcast is over nine years old. Can you believe that? It That's turned right. nine in September of 2023. So next year will be the 10th anniversary. Well, and uh, yeah, crazy. I don't think I had a timeline in mind for it when I started it, but yeah, it just got bigger than I thought. And here we are doing it and I absolutely love it. So you have done a great job and you provide food for thought and uh, inspiration for people. A lot of our, I and a lot of our other folks listen to your podcast and enjoy it. A lot of our staff members and, and uh, really appreciate it. And you did a, such a great job at our Leadership Institute in October. People uh, are still talking about that. So we had a couple thousand people who really were moved by your comments and, and moved to think differently too, you know, to really begin to ask questions about what does church look like going into the future? So thank you. Well, I really appreciate it. That's humbling and a real honor. It's amazing, you know, because you hear about, you know, largest United Methodist church in America, that kind of thing. And then you go and see it and it's like, oh, wow, like this thing's huge. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing what God's done in your midst. So it's been, we're, been exciting. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff today, but I want to start with change. Um, it's a very interesting season we're in. We have been through a lot of change, but I almost feel like a new era of church is dawning. We've been through so much over the last few years, and now there's something new emerging. So talk about uh, maybe a couple of moments, because you've been in church leadership now for multiple decades, um, of radical change in your life. What it brought, the challenges it brought. I'd, I'd like to start there. What are you learning about leading change? Well, change, you know, as, as we all know, change is constant. So if you're not, so we, we say around here, uh, you change, innovate, improve, or die. That's just how mm -hmm. it is. You're, you know, you're not going to stay, you can stay the same. You just know that that's a recipe for death. You are going to, now the gospel doesn't change. Our love for Christ doesn't change our love for people. There are certain things that are immutable. They're not going to change. But right. in terms of how we do ministry, everything changes. And one of the examples, I brought a little show and tell for you as, as I was thinking well, about this. let's do it. So well, this we are on my, YouTube now. Yeah, this was my first computer here at the church. So this oh, that's church, incredible. That's a, wait, yeah. that's a Macintosh classic? Classic. So I bought this 
when we started the church in 1990. And the computer still runs. It, it will boot up Microsoft Word version 3.0 in three uh-huh. minutes. Oh, God. It, it, yeah. Uh, it has a 20 megabyte hard drive or maybe a 40 megabyte hard drive. When, we, when I bought that computer in 1990, there was no internet. There was, uh, uh, there was no wireless printing. There was, I had it hooked up to an image writer or a laser writer to NT. Yeah, laser and, writers. Geez. Yeah. You what know, you and, forget about, right? Exactly. Exactly. And you forget how, so there was, you know, there was none of these at that time. Right. I mean, there uh-huh. were pagers, you could have a pager and I was determined not to have a pager because I, I thought I do not want to be, you know, I don't want to be tethered to something where people can get me at any moment, you know, and yeah. of course today the world is so changed. You're, you're accessible almost all the time. Yeah. Uh, so thinking about those changes that happened, you know, that, that computer, which sits in my office is a reminder of this idea of change, innovate, improve, or die. If, you know, when Apple computer was making those, they, they flew off the shelves. You couldn't make them fast enough. And today, uh, you know, if that's what Apple was still making, they'd be out of business. And so mm-hmm. constantly asking, how do we do this better? What are the needs of people? How are we, um, you know, how can we, how can we try new things that might actually work in reaching people in ways that we hadn't before? And of course, COVID led a lot of people to have to innovate who weren't innovating previously. Mm-hmm. We've been online for online worship for about, I think we've been online about 12 years for online wow. worship. But even that changed. You know, we used to do a look-in service where people would watch as we streamed live. And then we figured out, you know, that wasn't as great of an experience. And during COVID, when we're looking right in the camera and there's nobody in the sanctuary, people actually had a better worship experience because we were looking in the camera. We were talking Mm -hmm. to them as opposed to them watching as we talked to everyone else. I mean, that's just an example of the kind of things that, that, um, that have changed. And so in some ways, we've changed dramatically over the years, you know, uh, technologically, how we're reaching people, how we're connecting. On the other hand, some of the basic things are still essential to how we do what we do. So I don't, having been pastor here for 33 years, I still recognize this place, you know, mm-hmm. over, the, over the course of those 33 years, the, our, our mission has stayed the same. Our, you know, some fundamental things about how we do ministry has stayed the same uh, in terms of caring about people and, you know, providing worship services that are meaningful and serving in the community and all of that. While we've adopted, you know, new technologies, we've, you know, we've had to think differently about how we do ministry. When we started, we had one worship service and it was a more traditional service. And today we have, you know, we have a variety of worship services in six different locations across Kansas City and on TV and online. And we find, you know, we have more people join us online every Sunday than join us in person. We have uh, twice as many people join us on TV, TV as join us online, which was a technology I hadn't anticipated using. It was old school TV, but it still reaches people that that were un, non-religious people who were flipping through channels and, you know, end up reaching those folks too. So anyway, lots of changes. And I, the other thing that I found is that what I did when we were starting the church, and you and I are both church plant, well, you in essence were a church planter. At yeah, the church effectively, you, that's how it worked out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the things that I did when we first began, some of those I'm still doing, but some of them you figure out, I have to hand that off to somebody else because there's certain things only I can do. It's not that only I can do them, but I'm, this is, these are essential parts of my job. If I don't do those, everything else is going to suffer. So as an example, you know, we still follow up on every first time visitor at Resurrection by delivering a coffee mug to them. We started doing that in 1990. So follow up on first time visitors is really important for those who come in person. But I used to deliver all those coffee mugs. Well, today I don't have the four hours to do that because there's something else that's filled up that four hours. So my job is to make sure somebody's doing it and mm-hmm. to ask the questions about that. So anyway, lots of lots of change. And I'll say one last thing. I'll shut up. I used to think I thrive on change. I thought I love change. I thrive mm-hmm. on change. And then um, one time I had a couple of staff people come and they said, you know, we think we need to change this, you know, this thing. It was confirmation, I think. And uh, I listened to them. And I gave them 10 reasons why it was a bad idea to change. And when they walked out the door a little discouraged, I thought, shoot, I only like the changes I initiate. I really don't like anybody else's change. It's just mine. <laughs> so I think that willingness to say we have to be willing to change. We have to be willing to innovate and try new things. And we have to always be willing to improve. We're always asking that question. How do we improve what we're doing uh, or we're going to die? Geek question. Do you have any memory of how much that Apple or that uh, classic uh, computer cost yeah, you know, back I, in 1990? In my recollection, it was about $1,500. Oh, 
Yeah. Which and is like three thousand dollars in today's Yeah, that was nineteen ninety dollars. So yeah, that's thirty thirty three years ago. Yeah, it would have been yeah, exactly three to six thousand dollars for yeah, <laughs> crazy. They were not cheap. They were no. not cheap. No. But I remember that. Yeah, I think my first, which was a, a build out, it was a an, like a uh, uh, not an apple, and it was like thirty five hundred dollars. One yeah. of the purchases we made. We were married in nineteen ninety. So oh yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. That's interesting. All right. Uh, so for those who don't know the whole backstory, uh, Church of the Resurrection, church plant, transition, how did, how did that go? Yeah, it was a church plant. So when I graduated from seminary in 1988, my dream was to start a church for thinking people who didn't go to church anywhere. And I thought, I, I think I understand how a lot of unchurched people think in my community, in this area. Our church is located near where I graduated from high school, went off to college, went off to graduate school, seminary, came back. And I told the bishop, we have bishops in the United Methodist Church, and I said, what I'd really like to do is to start a church for thinking people uh, who don't go to church anywhere. And, uh, you know, classic new church plant. And we started, so I was an associate pastor for two years, left that church to start this church. We had about 20 people who came with us to begin with from, from that United Methodist Church. And, uh, you know, we cast this vision for building a Christian community where non-religious and nominally religious people are becoming deeply committed Christians. And and that drove everything that we did from that time on. So we began with about 90 people the first Sunday in worship. And that was, we met in a funeral home chapel, which is where our name came from. Church of the Resurrection seemed like a good name. <laughs> church meeting in a mortuary. And uh, so we started there and it, you know, it just grew, you know, we went from 90 to a year later, 150 to 275. So we've grown about 50% a year for the first probably 10 years. And uh, within, you know, within probably five or six years, we were the largest uh, church in Kansas City, and within five years after that, the largest United Methodist Church in the country. So, wow, two thirds of those people were folks who identified as non-religious or nominally religious. That's incredible, and that's a very rare story. There are big churches, but a lot of the time, that's that's transfer growth, right? right. Is right. The, the the quiet secret? And how many would call you know Church of the Resurrection home today? Well, we have we do still use membership as a way of helping people yeah, think sure. about our expectations. And so in terms of actual members, adults and children, I think we're around 24, 25,000 yeah. on a given weekend, we'll have between 25 and uh, 35,000 people, <clears throat> excuse me, between 25 and 35,000 people between our local Kansas city television online and at our six locations in Kansas city. And on Christmas wow. Eve, we'll have over a hundred thousand people who'll join us. Uh, for Crazy. Christmas Eve candlelight. So, you know, there's a lot of people in Kansas City who think of us as their church home, even if they are not technically members. Yeah. Now, your theological journey is an interesting one because we do have a lot of mainline listeners, and I love my conversations with you because, uh, you know, often it's easy if you come from a non denominational setting to go, nothing is growing inside denominations, but yeah. that's not necessarily true. Right. But you didn't start out a United Methodist. How did that, how did that evolve for you? Sure. Well, in a nutshell, I was baptized Catholic. My mom was yeah. from the church of Christ and my dad was from the Catholic church. And my grandmother, who was a saint, uh, she was mm -hmm. Catholic and she really wanted me baptized in her church. And she would take me to mass and, you know, Friday night, bingo night with the nuns and <clears throat> excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. And she, um, she taught me to pray and gave me my first Bible. It was a really pivotal influence in my spiritual life. And then my parents started trying to find a church halfway between fundamentalist, Protestant, and uh, and Catholic, and they ended up at a United Methodist Church. And okay. John Wesleyan Methodism was often identified as the via media. Episcopalians think of themselves the same way, but uh, in England, Methodism was the via media between you know the low church Protestant and the and the Catholics being the middle road, right? Yeah, right, yeah. the middle way. Yeah, the middle yeah, via media and. Um, and so my folks started going to a Methodist church for a few years. We dropped out when they got divorced, and I became an atheist for a couple of years. And then uh, there was a guy going door to door, inviting people to church, a uh, relatively new church start, an Assembly of God church in, uh, in the community, not far, several miles from where I'm sitting right now. I didn't believe in God, but for some reason, this man, he spoke with a microphone pressed to his throat, an electrolarynx. His vocal cords had been removed, and wow. he was just knocking on doors and and uh, a buddy of mine had stayed up the night before doing drugs. And that next day, he stopped, stopped by my house and said, hey, I know you're new to the neighborhood. I'd like to invite you to come to church. And we, uh, I thought, you know, there was something about the fact that he had a disability inviting and talking to me, a 14-year-old kid, like I, like I mattered, you know, that I thought, I'll, I'll go once. 
So we went to church, and I, again, I didn't believe in God, and the worship was way different from anything I'd ever experienced. Hands raised, peak, speaking in tongues. It really freaked yeah, me this out. This is Assemblies of God, fully. Assemblies of God, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they had three really cute girls sitting on the front row, and I didn't believe in God, but I believed in girls and started going to church. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was there that I began, I thought, you know, I'm going to give this God thing a chance. And I decided I'd read the Bible, see if uh, what I could make of that. I loved ancient Greek mythology, and I thought this is just ancient Hebrew mythology. So I began on page one of the Catholic Bible my grandmother had given me when I was a kid. And um, by the time I got to the Gospel of Luke, I, uh, I, I began to fall in love with Jesus with Matthew. Mm-hmm. Mark, uh, again, I, I really found myself drawn to Jesus. I didn't believe in the resurrection. I was like, eh, I can't quite buy that. But I really love this guy who, you know, who really stood up to the religious hypocrites, who cared about the nobodies and when I got to the Gospel of Luke, I found myself, I fell in love with Jesus. I got to mm-hmm. the end of the Gospel, and all the way through, he's concerned, as you know, the Gospel of Luke is written for, Luke wants to make the point that Jesus cared about the nobodies, the marginalized, yeah, yeah. the people who were treated as second class, whether it was the lepers or the women or, you know, the sinners and tax collectors. And I thought, that's who, I feel like that's who I am. I'm one of those lost boys, you know, who needed somebody. I needed, I wanted Christ. And I got to the end and I read the resurrection story once more. And I thought, at this point, I thought, how else could the story end if in some way, and I didn't understand the theology or the Nicene Creed or anything else, but, but if, if somehow God was in Jesus, if God had come to us in Jesus, and, his, and the end of the story was his crucifixion, that would mean that evil had the final word, and death and hate and jealousy. And, and so in my 14-year-old brain, I thought, no, it has to end with his resurrection. That's God's way of saying that evil and hate and sin don't have the final word. And so I got down on my knees next to my bed and I said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And I know I'm 14 years old, but if there's anything you can do with me, I pray you will. I'd like to be your disciple. And that was, you know, that was my official sort of conversion, if you will. And then uh, following that, about two years later, you know, I started having people tell me, God's got a calling on your life. You're going to be a pastor. And, <laughs> um, and eventually I practice. I, the pastor asked me to preach a sermon one Sunday, and I said, sure, how hard can that be? And I got up. It was a terrible sermon. It was horrible. It was horribly embarrassing. But when I was done, I knew that's, I felt like that's what God made me for. And so anyway, I had a lot of questions though in, the, in my church. I had a lot of theological questions. I loved science, and I had questions about really is evolution anti-Christian? Isn't, isn't it possible you could believe in both of these things? And just a lot of, lot of theological questions. And at one point, you know, one of the folks in the church said, Adam, don't ask so many questions. Just, mm-hmm. just take it by faith. And I'm like, I can't, you know, I think God gave us a brain for a reason. And I, I want to, you know, and anyway, I got to Oral Roberts University. I stu- studying to be a Pentecostal pastor and Assembly of God pastor. And I love the Assembly of God. I'm very grateful for its emphasis on the Holy Spirit and on the memorizing scripture and the Bible and, and sharing your faith and, and a passionate faith. I appreciate all those things. Um, but I found myself struggling in my freshman year in school. Two of my best friends were killed in an accident. They were electrocuted. Led me to a lot of questions about the issue of providence and theodicy and how God works in the world. And, and uh, as I was wrestling through those things, I found myself drawn to John Wesley and, and Arminianism and an emphasis on free will and, and that God isn't, uh, you know, from an Armenian perspective, God isn't controlling everything. God is ultimately in control. Yeah. But God has given us in Genesis, uh, in Genesis 2 and 3, God gave us dominion and, uh, and Genesis 1. Gave us dominion, and so we make decisions, and we have we have the capacity to to uh, react to our circumstances. And the world is a, sometimes a dangerous world, and and the promise of God isn't to put a bubble around us. If we only love Jesus enough, nothing bad's going to happen to us. And I often say to people, how how could that be the promise of the Christian faith when our Lord was tortured to death at the age of thirty three? Yeah. Like like Christianity is not about promising nothing bad's going to happen to you. It's that no matter what happens to you, God walks with you and God redeems the suffering. So it was all in that. I, I found myself, I joined the United Methodist Church and my, what I felt God calling me to do was to be a part of the re- re- renewal and revival of this, you know, once great denomination. Hmm. And uh, by that time it had been in decline for 20 years. And I'm, you know, I'm nine, 18, 19 years old and I feel like, okay, somehow God is going to use me to try to breathe new life into whatever little United Methodist churches I would, I would serve. And uh, I had no idea, you know, what ended up happening at resurrection would happen. But I found myself committed to this, both its theology, but also to the idea of, you know, that we're connected together and that it wasn't just about whatever church I would serve, but 
How can I be a part of helping other churches? In some ways, what you're doing in your ministry right now is you're saying, how do I help other churches? And I thought, yeah, there's yeah, this that's denomination that's struggling. Yeah. And how can I, how can I be a part of that? And again, who was I? I was just some punk kid who, but God kind of put that on my heart. And, and um, that continues to be where I'm at today. Went to graduate school at Southern Methodist University, and I had a kind of a uh, conservative, evangelical, charismatic undergraduate training and a bit more progressive uh, mainline, uh, you know, seminary training. And I found that those actually worked pretty well together. That yeah, they could. They, they could. They balance each other pretty well. So anyway, that's a little of my story. No, I appreciate you sharing it. That's a really interesting background. We're both poised toward the head, not the heart. I remember saying you're supposed to love God with your mind. Yeah. What happened to the intellectual tradition? Not that I would not claim to be an intellectual. What was it about Methodism that was attractive to you as a thinking person? Yeah. Well, you know, so I was kind of converted to United Methodism by reading the United Methodist Book of Discipline. It is our rule book, if you will, but the front right. third, the front third of it is... Or, the Book uh, of Forms uh, didn't do that for me, by the way, yeah, as a yeah, Presbyterian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, I found it's... So as I was reading the historical statement, uh, yeah. John Wesley and the early Methodists, and, you know, this this union of the, what what I would call today, the evangelical and social gospel. Today, even the word yeah. evangelical is distorted, and you don't know exactly what it means anymore. But, but you know, Wesley led the 18th century evangelical revival in the British Isles. And he was passionate about helping people come to faith in Christ. He wanted people to know Christ. He took the gospel out to where the people were. He went to the unchurched people. He went to the coal miners, and he went to the farmers. Mm -hmm. And, he, you know, he was preaching outside of the church in the fields. He, he said one time, I decided to, to make myself more vile by preaching out in the fields and not inside a church, as though it was vile to preach outside. And he spent, you know— half a million miles riding horseback across the British Isles to take the gospel or wherever people were. I love that. I love the fact that he was concerned for the poor. So, you know, in his, in his ministry, there was, you know, at one point he chose not to get his hair cut anymore and he gave the money to the poor. He, he began looking mm -hmm. at, you know, this is a college student. He's, he began looking at, um, you know, that the gospel is not the gospel if it's not also being concerned for the people around you who are in need that, that the church the body of Christ is, he didn't use this term necessarily, but is the incarnation of Jesus in the world. And so when God looks to see where there's hunger or brokenness or pain or injustice, the church is meant to rise up and address that. And I love that because in my, in my limited experience in my one church where I came to faith in Christ, we helped our church members, but we never, I don't ever remember being challenged to go serve the homeless or to look at what are the, what are the underlying systemic issues in society that should be addressed to help the world look more like the kingdom of God. And I, Somehow I'd missed, even though I'd read them, I somehow missed the minor prophets and the call to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God or Matthew chapter 25 and the, and the sheep and the goats. I, I, all of those things I had somehow missed. And so I love the fact that Wesley brought together the evangelical and social gospels and held them together. They went together. They were two sides of a coin. But I also love the fact that he, you know, his faith was one that was both of the head and the heart. You mentioned this a moment ago, but in Pentecostalism, there's such an emphasis on the heart. And mm. if you're moved and you feel something, you're being fed, as though being fed is, is the state of your heart. But the intellect is sometimes, not always, but in some, some churches, that's not emphasized. And there's many others that they do emphasize this. I love the fact that, that he was an Oxford professor, if you will. He was an Oxford uh, 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 fellow. And, uh, and so, you know, he cared about the intellect, wrote dozens of books, was concerned about the intellectual side. But he was also concerned about the heart, what people experienced. And, and you know, it was in his conversion was when he felt his heart strangely warmed by, you know, by listening to Martin Luther's preface to the book of Romans, his commentary in the book of Romans. So the head and the heart was really important to me. But then he also added to that the hands that, that and in, I think this is true in tons of churches, no doubt the churches you've served as well. But I just love the fact that in, in this denomination, when I was joining it, it was like, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to serve. You've got to be looking in the community and seeing where there's a gap between how the world looks now and how the kingdom of God is, and you do something about it. And so somebody told me the other day, they were here visiting me, and they, they go to another church. They said, what people know in Kansas City about resurrection is you guys are doers. You are mm -hmm. always out there serving, looking to see where is there a need in Kansas City, and how can we as Christians do something about it? So anyway, I, I loved all of those things. Uh, and people say, I'll have people ask me, you know, I can't figure you out. Are you liberal or conservative? And my answer is always yes, of course. And they're like, no, which is it? Are you liberal or conservative? I'm like, do I have to pick? Because I think both of those are really good ideas. 
To be liberal means to be generous of spirit. It means to be willing to reform. To be conservative means you hold on to certain things, but even if they're not popular anymore, because they are they are truths that we have to hold on to. And I think if you're conservative without being liberal, you're stuck. If you're liberal without being conservative, you're unmoored. But if you bring those two things together, they're both really good words. That's a good word. That's a really good word. Um, you know, it reminds me of what the late Tim Keller often said that, and he's not, it's not unique to him, but he articulated it well. Evangelicals really focus on the personal relationship with Jesus, mainliners often, and he too was a mainliner, so to speak. That was his tradition, as was mine before I went non denominational. You know, was, well, we're more about social justice, more about the vertical, more about the horizontal, not the vertical. Yeah. And of course, the gospel is a fusion of all of the above, right? right? If you're going to look at the whole gospel, it is both love God and love your neighbor. Yeah. And for some reason, we seem to have separated that in the two strands. Evangelicals more concerned about the state of your soul. Yeah. You know, mainliners more concerned about do you have food and bread and shelter and all of those things. And sometimes forget the state of your soul, right? right. And so I love that fusion. Um, you know, what, uh, uh, piggybacking yeah. on that, uh, I often teach people this when it comes to the gospel. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus' call is for people to follow him. It's about doing. F- come follow me. You're going to find the sheep and the goats there. You're going to find the parable of the Good Samaritan. You're going to find, you know, this emphasis uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke with very little emphasis on this idea of, I mean, you, you won't find Jesus saying in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, accept me into your heart or right. have a personal relationship with me. You're not going to find that, that typical evangelical language on Jesus' lips in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You are going to find it in, in different language, but in John's gospel. So in John's gospel, it's, it's believe in the Son. It's, you know, it, those who believe in, you know, will have life in his name. And so it's all about faith and trust and, and abiding in me, abide in me as I abide in you. And, you know, so you've got this idea of, of what feels much more like a classic evangelical personal relationship with Jesus, uh, you know, gospel in John and in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's much more about doing and acting and, and serving and following. And I tell people, we need, to your point, Carrie, we need, we need Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We need, we need all those. But I also remind people there's three synoptic gospels to one Johannine gospel. And so this idea of we have a relationship with Jesus, now three of the gospels tell us to come follow him and to live out our faith yeah. in the world. And it's, it's how we live, not, to, not that we're saved by our works, but as we all know, we are saved so that we might live a life that's pleasing to God, so that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. Uh, and so what's interesting to me is you built, you know, God has built this very large church, the largest United Methodist church in America, two thirds unchurched. And again, I just want to underscore that. That's something I always tracked very, very carefully. Our church still does. We're about 50-50 churched versus unchurched people. But, you know, the backroom conversation, if I ever share that off the record with people, they'll be like, well, you know, that almost never happens. It's like ninety-five percent transfer growth and five yep. percent conversion growth, etc. Yep. So when you fuse the true two traditions, and broadly speaking, mainline and evangelical, right, which is what we've been talking about, how does that, in your experience over these decades, how does that intersect with unchurched people, right? Yep. Like how? Because again, that's that's remarkable to see that the majority of people didn't yep. have a church background. Yeah. It's interesting. I remember having a conversation with a, a Pentecostal pastor at a church that had started up about the same time we had. And he took me to lunch. He said, I don't understand it. You guys are reaching all of these people who go to church and we really want to reach them. And we're reaching people who go to other Pentecostal churches who are transferring because we have a better worship leader or are leaving because right. they have a better worship leader or whatever. And um, I think, and, and I, I want to go back and say one other thing too. Most mainline churches in their inception were evangelical. It's just we, we came out of the 20th century with uh, sort of different ways of thinking about evangelical. And yeah, so and the I, social I, gospel. I mean, at the beginning of the 20th century, the social right. gospel imperative in North America and England and so on was a big yeah. defining factor and kind of a, a splitting of the ways in yeah, the church. That's right. that's right. And I think that was tragic because both sides of that equation have a part of the gospel. They yeah. have a half of the gospel, not a whole gospel. And I would say, you know, as a, I'm a mainline pastor, and I still can, cons- I, I hesitate to use the word anymore just because it's how it's now re- been redefined, but, and still evangelical. To be evangelicals, you want people to know Jesus. You want, 
You want people to have faith in Christ and mm-hmm. to be see their lives transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I think we, I, I think even mainliners at their best, they're evangelical, but in that yeah. mainline sort of sense of it. Um, but what was your question? I'm sorry. I, I, oh I think, no, I was uh, thinking about what parts of your approach to ministry, yeah. that fusion yeah. of the head and the heart and the hands has really resonated with unchurched people. And you were saying, yeah. you know, you had a colleague across town who was like, hey, yeah, yeah. we just keep getting transfer growth. Like right, what is right. resonating with all these unchurched people? Because that, yeah. if you want to look at, if we're going to reverse the decline in the church in our generation, or at least make a dent in it, it's not yeah. going to come from just like, our church is growing, but the church right. is dying. You right. know, that's not, that's not it. It, you know, reversing the decline in the church means actually going out there and making disciples of people who don't know Jesus. So I'm always very interested in figuring out where a church has had success, what are the ingredients? What are, you know, in your feedback over the decades? And Tim Keller, because I had this conversation with him before he passed away, would say the types of messages that the people he was reaching in New York resonated with shifted over the decades, that there were three distinct eras. And he said now, you know, before he died, he said he was starting to think about, I have to preach through identity because identity is such a big thing. It used to be, hey, the world is empty, you know, come on over here. Or, this is not your parents' faith. And now it's like, no, your identity, like if you fuse all your identity in sexuality, you fuse all your identity in your career, you fuse all your identity in your relationships, that's going to leave you empty and bankrupt. Well, what about yeah. fusing your identity in Christ, yeah. et cetera? So, you know, yeah. there are paradigms and and ideas, or yeah. it could be something more practical. It's just like when they see the gospel in action, they yeah. resonate. Because uh, we got a lot of people taking notes, listening to this, wondering, yeah, sure. where's the secret sauce here, uh, yeah. Adam? Well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share several things. One is yeah. we yeah. think about everything that we do through the lens of how does this speak to the unchurched people in our community or in Kansas awesome. City? Yeah, and yeah. so really, you know, there are at least two sermon series a year that I plan at Christmas. We announce them at Christmas Eve and Easter that are when we have the most number of unchurched people in church. And, and these are sermon series aimed at, aimed at addressing the kind of questions unchurched people are asking. So um, I'm going to take a shameless moment and give a plug for something. But a Go year ago, it. we did a series of sermons. So I did, I'd surveyed people both in the church and outside the church to find out what were their doubts? What were their sources of questions that they wrestled with? Mm-hmm. And we do a series like this every, probably every five to 10 years. And uh, we surveyed a thousand people and we looked to see, we gave them like 20 choices and opportunities to, you know, add their own. And there were six or seven common sources of doubt for people, unchurched people, as well as church people. We found 95% of all people wrestle with doubt some. So even the church people are wrestling with doubt. And doubt's not a bad thing. We, you know, doubt's a good thing. And in the Bible, all the great biblical heroes wrestled with doubt along the way. Um, but we did a series of sermons called Wrestling Without Finding Faith. And we just said, we announced on Christmas Eve, we had a little 90 or 30 sec, 60 second video promo for it. We said, these are the questions we're going to wrestle with in the, in the six weeks after, uh, after Christmas Eve. We hope you'll come back. And that just came out actually yesterday. This book just came out. It's called Wrestling Without Finding Faith. Cool. And it's a small little book. It's a pretty easy read. But, you know, I wrote this hoping that people might be able to give it to their friends, their kids, a lot of their kids who wrestle with these questions. And I'll just tell you, these are the questions that, these were the doubts that came up that we uh, that each became a chapter in the end. But uh, and the book begins with in praise of honest doubt. But then is there a God? And does does science eliminate the need for God? Uh, the good book wrestling with the Bible and the questions we have about the Bible are all non Christians going to hell? And uh, I love there was a the chapter on all non Christians going to hell. I'll just read this uh, this opening because it came from a guy who had been a Pentecostal pastor himself and ended up leaving the pastorate and. Uh, he says, um, he says he considers himself he considers himself now an agnostic with Christian roots. And his text he sent me was uh, the question about other religions is one of my biggest struggles with the whole Christianity thing. I cannot accept that a good, kind, loving, gracious, just God would send a kind, caring, loving, faithful Hindu to hell, Hindu to hell, simply because they didn't accept Jesus. That literally makes no sense to me. That's how the chapter begins. Is just okay. There's a whole lot of people out there like him. You know, he's a former yeah. pastor. There's a lot of people out there like that. So anyway, the next one is, is heaven real? I mean, a lot of people want to know. They've lost a loved one. Is there really a heaven? And and why do you believe that? Is there any evidence for that? And then when prayers go unanswered, and then finally, why do the innocent suffer? And oh, wow. the postscript has a little chapter on, uh, or a little section on uh, another question they ask, and that is, would God really love me? And mm-hmm. so you get to a kind of an inv- evangelical invitation at the end just to say, here's what the Bible says about love and God's love for you. And yes, God does know you and love you. And 
But anyway, so what I'd say is that we we think about sermons, we think about programs, ministries, outreach, everything we do, we think of through the lens of who are the unchurched people around us and what would cause them to go, you know what, I think I need to bring my kids to that. Or I think, I mean, this is what we eat, sleep, drink, and breathe around here is that. And then understanding the the audience we're trying to reach, because I think, and this is, I think, a, was the hang up with this pastor I mentioned to you a moment ago, is they spoke Pentecostalese. Mm. They, the language that they spoke was a language that was insider language about, you know, and, and in a particular sort of Pentecostal insider language. And the reality was that and a whole lot of ways that they worshiped was very powerful for the people in the congregation and other Pentecostals. And it was, it was off-putting to non-religious people. And so I, I think that's, you know, a critical piece of it. So thinking about your message, mm-hmm. how you're communicating, what you're doing to go out of your way to welcome people, because there's a lot of people out there who'll say, I'll give church a try once. And, uh, and this is where like that delivering coffee mugs to first time visitors or, you know, everything we do to connect with unchurched people when they visit the church, if they come to a wedding or a funeral, you know, we want to make sure that wedding or funeral is so awesome and that it speaks so well to unchurched people that those people say, you know, we should try this church this Sunday, you know? And, and so, uh, so, and then following up on all the first time visitors. And then I would say um, another piece of this, and I think this is a really important piece. So there's two last pieces. One has to do with, I think the perception unchurched people have of the church, if you ask them, is uh, these are a lot of pretty judgmental people in the church. Yeah. And it's not a very grace-filled place. And, and we say one of our leadership principles here is it's all about people. And when people walk in the door, we want them to feel like they are loved and they're cared for. And that, uh, I mean, we're going to talk, we'll talk about judgment sometimes, but that judgment is not, uh, is not the kind of judgment they often are hearing. It's, it's stuff everybody recognizes. You know, we're, we're all a bit more self-centered than we should be. We, we become materialistic. We, we don't care enough about other people. We're, um, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the issue of the day, of course, is homosexuality today. And the impression that a lot of people have, at least for a lot of churches, that's the issue of the day, is that they know where the church is and the church isn't a place that's good for their children or their friends or their family members. And uh, so when people come here, uh, they hear Jesus and they hear, if you look at Jesus, I mean, look in the Gospels, you look at Matthew, look in particularly the Synoptic Gospels, the only time he's condemning people is the religious people who were hypocrites. Hmm. He's not, he's not condemning other people. The, the, in John's gospel, the woman who's caught in the act of adultery, I don't condemn you, you know, and the people who were condemning you have all dropped their stones and they've walked away. And so the people Jesus condemns are the, are the self-righteous Pharisees. Yeah. And so yeah. I think in our language, and I think all of your people aren't listening to you if they're in that spot of condemning people all the time, but I think it's, I think it's understanding what are people hearing and what they were hearing and seeing from Jesus was a radical love and a grace and a mercy and an, you know, a willingness to love and, and care for them and, and to meet them where they were in their brokenness and the ability to tell stories from everyday life that touched their hearts, you know, the prodigal son and a whole bunch of other great stories. The last thing I would say, and I think this is really, really important and part of the, for mainline Christians, and I think this is true for a lot of evangelical churches too, but the old adage, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think this idea, so Rick Warren used to have this baseball diamond, right? Mm-hmm. You get to first base and you came to know Jesus and you get to second base and you'd grow in your faith. I'm, I'm probably getting it wrong, but it's something like this. You get to third base, play, base and you discover your spiritual shape and fourth base is, base is serving in mission in the world. And for many years, it, uh, and I love Rick, uh, but for many years, that was telling other people about Jesus. That was serving in mission in the world and being nice to people. And then he went to Africa and he discovered there's poverty in the world and brokenness. And, and all of a sudden... I used to kid around and say, Rick became a United Methodist. Yeah. He, he suddenly, you know, what, he had both the evangelical gospel, but then he's like, we got to do something about poverty. We got to do something about injustice. And, um, and what I, what I've shared with people is the, the baseball diamond is reversed at resurrection. We start by inviting people to go and serve in the community. We start by doing, you know, by inviting people to come and show up for our, you know, our, our, you know, activities in the community to serve other people. Christmas Eve candlelight will take our biggest offering of the year on Christmas Eve candlelight. And we give away the entire Christmas Eve offering. Half of it is benefiting the poor in Kansas City, and half of it 
around the world. And, you know, last Christmas Eve, it was $2.4 million people gave in one night wow. to be able to serve in these, you know, and we show videos. These are the kids, and you can come volunteer. You don't have to be a member of our church. You can come volunteer. You can go with us on a mission trip, even if you're not a you know follower of Jesus yet. Come and be a part of this. And the other day, I saw this wonderful Jewish woman here in Kansas City, and every time I see her, she comes to talk to me. She says, I love Church of the Resurrection. So thank you for allowing me to go on all your mission trips to Malawi and Africa. I just, I, I love to serve there. And it's so cool to be with your people. And, and so that when people look at the church and they see that the church is actually positively impacting their community and they're seeing that, that they're closing, to use Ron Heifetz terminology at Harvard, they're closing the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. Mm. They see the church actually doing that. It's a value add. It's actually making our city better because it's addressing the real needs of the community. People are drawn to churches like that. And that's what I find in particular with unchurched people today. They go, you know what? And even if they don't go to church, they go, I really respect your church. I get this all the time from like, you know, and I hear this especially from Jewish people and sometimes from Muslims. Like if I was going to church, I'd be going to resurrection. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And so it's kind of fun to see. And our people are moved by that. I mean, our people feel like our purpose isn't just to add X number of new conversions in the coming year. That's awesome. And we want to do that. But our purpose is to incarnate Christ in the world and to help Kansas City look like the kingdom of God in other parts of the world. And, and so people, they'll give to that. They'll sacrifice for that. They want to be a part of that. And in the process of that, we're teaching discipleship. We're teaching scripture. We're helping people understand, you know, a theology that, that brings together, you know, the head, heart, and the hands. And so I, I would, if you were asking me, I would say those are the things that I think are critical for a church to grow. And even then, you can do all those things right. And we're living in a time where the number of people going to church is declining, where across the country, when, when you and I started our churches, uh, 50% of the people were unchurched. And today, last time I looked, it was something like 61 or 62% in the average community. And so, and it's getting harder and harder to reach, you know, younger generations. But what I know about those younger generations is they're interested in community and a place that cares and where relationships can be forged. And they are interested in making a difference in the world yeah. or yeah. being a part of an organization that's that's altruistic and making a difference in the world, they don't yet know that they are going to buy into the Jesus that Christians talk about because they they like Jesus. They just don't know that Christianity offers a good picture of him. But those other things, they know those are needs. So I think you and I are probably the same age or within a year of each other. And I'm 59. you're 59, I'm 58. So yeah. very, very I close. You, okay. Very close. Yeah. And then you know, you've been leading in the same place for 33 years, almost 34, which is incredible. Um, how do you keep your passion fresh, like for the long haul? Because that's a pretty rare thing to lead a large, growing, expansive ministry and not be sitting back, relaxing and enjoying the flight at 59. Yeah, yeah. Um well, let's be honest. There are times where I have felt like quitting. There are, you know, uh, and during COVID, the last four years, between uh, the political turmoil in our country, uh, you know, we were leading into, uh, you know, speaking up, speaking out against racism during Black Lives Matter, uh, COVID, and everything that happened during COVID, and and in our denomination, you know, we're one of those churches that's uh, we're a centrist congregation, but we are advocating for full inclusion of people. And that meant that, you know, every time I turn around, there were more people mad about something oh, yeah, or people yeah. who, and, and it's easy to get mad when you're not sitting in church together and you're not sitting in Sunday school class mm. together and they're hearing me preach, but they're not looking in my, you know, they're not sitting in the same room. And, and it seemed like every time I turned around, there was somebody else peeling off or somebody mad and, and, uh, and you just get weary in yeah. the middle of that. You just think this isn't fun anymore. I used to have fun doing this and now I just feel beat up, you know, and, but I also find it's easier to do that at 59 than 35. At 35, I don't know if this was true for you, but at 35, when I'd get nasty emails and anonymous letters, I'd fret over them. Like, you know, I, I just, I'd create an eight page response. Yes. I'd be, you know, I'd be upset about it and stew on it. And now I'm like, well, if we're not the right church for you, there's like a thousand others here in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. God bless you. I hope you find a really great church for you, you know, because it doesn't, like, it, like my ego is not caught up in it anymore. It's, well, it still is. I'm yeah, sure, but, but I have more it, dissociation it, than I used to. That's very yeah, fair. And yeah. it's not its not a lack of compassion, I hope. But Seth Godin right. has this beautiful phrase. He says, it's not for you. All right, I made this product. Yeah. You know, you don't like my mug. 
it's not for you. Yeah, so that's all right. Yeah, there are exactly. other mugs in the world. And I, I, that's what I yep. try, you know, I try to learn from it. I'm like, okay, what did I do? Did I really step in it? Did I say something I don't yeah. believe? Did I, was I mean? Was I, yep. you know, own it? But then like, all right, at the yeah. end of the day, this isn't for you. That's okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. So, so I do think it's harder to do church ministry today. And I think, I think for a lot of people, if mm -hmm. your ego and identity and your model of ministry was that we have to be having X number of conversions a year and X number of baptisms, and we've got to, you're just going to be sticking the press. Yeah. If you're, because it's not going to be like that anymore. Uh, it will be in some places. We, we just had 150 people join the church last wow. Sunday. You know, it's very exciting, but. But 50% growth a year is a phase and a season exactly. and not repeatable ad infinitum. That's right. So that's especially likely to happen in newer and and you know early uh, early part of your church history. And that's true in every company as yeah. well. If you track Apple's growth, they're not going to have 50% growth a year like they did when they introduced the yeah. iPhone. It's not that doesn't look like that anymore. It's incremental, but but it's also a different world. And so part of that looks like, you know, I, I can get depressed if I look in our sanctuary and I think how many people we had in 2019 who were in there versus how many people we have in the sanctuary today. Last Sunday, I think in 2019, just at the, so we have six locations. Right. So at the Leewood location, that's our big, that's where you spoke. We had 6,000 people, something like that in the Leewood location. And then another couple thousand at our other locations in 2019 before COVID. And last Sunday, we had 4,000 in the Leewood location and we had 6,000 at all of our locations in person. But if I just look at that, I'm going to get depressed. Then I look at, okay, well, how many people are coming online now? Well, we doubled what we had online in 2019. Well, how many people are worshiping with us on TV on a given yeah. Sunday? We didn't even have TV then. And all of a sudden I'm looking, well, we have, we have three times, well, two to three times more people worshiping with us today than we did then, but it's not the same. They're not all in person. And again, so if it's butts and seats, if it's uh, conversions, if it's how many people actually, you know, officially joined the church, um, we're in a different world. And yeah. I think people have to be able to, and I've told our folks, we're starting over. This is a new church start now. I mean, in essence, we're asking new questions. We're not going to keep going back to 2019 to see how many people do we have then. We can compare to 2022 and see how we're doing numerically. But I want to know how many, how are we doing in terms of people getting involved in mission? How many people are getting involved in, how many are reading their Bibles? How many are in small groups? How many are, you know, serving the community? And, uh, but it is a different world that we're living in. Today. What is your self-talk like? When you look out and you realize, okay, there used to be six thousand, now there's four thousand. What's your what do you what do you say to yourself? Yeah, uh, I think. Well, first of all, I remind myself of all those other people that we're reaching yeah. and how many are worshiping with us in different ways, and saying that's part that's the new reality of church. Mm -hmm. uh, and it helps me when I remember that I actually like if I'm going to go to the doctor, I kind of like telemedicine. I sort of like it when I don't have to sit in the waiting room with people who are coughing. <laughs> And I can talk to the doctor for 15 minutes and I'd do that every single time. I'd rather not go back to the doctor's office at all. And I think about that. I think about, you know, my mom who worships with us now online or on TV and doesn't worship, actually she's on TV, doesn't come in person because she's a single mom who is, you know, in her seventies. And she said, I don't want to have to get dressed up to come, not even dressed up, but I don't want to get out of my jammies to come to church. And I don't really don't feel a connection with other people. So this is how I worship. I try to remember that yeah. and I try to remember it's about connecting, not that. And then I, I also say, and it's a new day. And so instead of feeling crummy about that, I can look back and, okay, we're up a thousand a Sunday since last year. And that year we were up a thousand a Sunday from the year before, but only is because we're rebuilding. Right. I don't know how long we'll even be rebuilding. I don't know. You know, I, I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. All I know is we're going to do the best we can to be the best church we can. And we're going to learn and grow and love people. And, and then, you know, I, I think, again, the world has changed. No, it's changed radically. And I'll give you a little illustration just from my world. You know, this is what I do full time these days. And I, a few years ago, I started this church trends thing, right? January, I released the church trends that I see for the year. And when we started, it was like quarter million people would access that. It was very exciting. And then, you know, blogging isn't what it used to be. Traffic dropped a little bit. Then it was 150,000, then 100,000, then it dropped below 100,000. And I'm like, what's going on? Are people not interested in this? And one of my team members said, you know, everyone's going to video. Why don't, this was in 2022. Why don't we record the 2023 church trends? 
and we'll do it on video and we'll do some 60 second reels for Instagram. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess we could. But part of me was like, hey, you can't reduce like this complex thinking to 60 seconds. Like you just can't do it. That's right. not fair. But we did it. And you know what was interesting? The reel that we released with the church trends got over 100,000 views. And it's like, oh, yeah. same content, just a different delivery method. So in 2024, we went all yeah. channels. We did the blog. We did a study guide. We did uh, seven reels for Instagram and TikTok. We did a YouTube version. And uh, we also are bringing the podcast around it for a whole month. And you know what? We'll probably, when that's launched, uh, have the biggest year we ever had with the church trends. It was just reinventing right. how we deliver the message. Yep, that's right. I think that's exactly right. And that's what we as churches have to do is figure out uh, there's still, so I'm going to say there's still a huge, if you use business terms, there's still a huge legacy yeah. audience out there for what the church is doing now. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we sometimes forget. We we have in mind, um, we want to reach young people, the younger generations. Awesome. I think that's fantastic. We've got to constantly be asking that question. And that's going to be frustrating because, uh, there's a large number of them who may not decide to check into church for a while in their lives, if at all. And so we're seeing a, you know, a lower participation of young adults than we saw in previous generations when they were the same age. So we're seeing this continue to decline. Um, but the other thing we, we also recognize is there is a legacy. There are people 50 and up who are thinking, I'm actually kind of interested in being a part of a community. I'm interested in finding out if there's more meaning in life. I'm interested in uh, in making a difference in my world. I'm interested in spiritual things. And I think we we might, for at least some of your listeners, to own that audience. So this uh, next week, I'm taking our staff to the new dinner theater, the new theater restaurant here in Kansas City. So I don't know if you've been to dinner theater, if they have them in your community, but mm -hmm. this one, LaVon and I have been uh, season ticket holders for 33 wow. years since we started Resurrection. And when we started going, we were in our twenties and like everybody else was in their fifties. Yeah. And we, you know, we were, we were like, like nobody our age was going to this thing. And now, of course, the average age is our right. age. <laughs> you know, it's, you go right into it. And yeah, yeah. And, but what that means is that since the average age is still the same, it's still roughly 60, um, a price 60, 65. You look around and like, okay, the people who were 65, 33 years ago are either dead or in a nursing yes. home or, you know, they're not here. So they've managed to figure out how with each generation, our niche is people who they, their kids are grown and they're at a certain stage in life. And we're going to show musicals that are for that stage. We're going to provide a buffet that's, you know, speaks to that stage. It's not going to be hip and cool. It's going to be for people who can afford to buy season tickets at the new sure. theater. And I'm interviewing the CEO of this organization just to say, how did you decide that that was okay? You know, you weren't fretting all the time about getting 20 year olds to come to the dinner theater. You've decided that you want to get each new generation of 50-year-olds to come to the dinner theater. And I think there may be something in that for churches as yeah, well. Yeah, that's that's a very different take, you know. And I think there might be something there because you still have blended worship, right? You do you do that. I saw it at the conference, so I assume that's what's happening on a Sunday morning. Uh, are you— well, We have both, Yeah, actually. yeah. We have, yeah, we have a choir and orchestra at our 11 o'clock service and our 7.30 service is traditional. And then our— um, 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. and our alternative uh, service at 11 o'clock are all uh, modern. Yeah. So, and then are you yeah. seeing inroads with the next generation? Are you seeing some inroads? And if so, how and, and what does that look like? Yeah, we are. And But I'll tell you where we reach. Uh, so we have, I don't know what the numbers, hundreds of young, you know, I'm going to say uh, Gen Z yeah. here at Newwood. But where we get the highest percentage is with every new location that we start. Ah. So we start new campuses or new locations. And what we find is the new locations reach, they reach the kids of our of our largest constituency at the Leewood location. So this location, the Leewood location, has aged as I've aged. Yeah. That's what and happens. That with pastors, does tend you know, to happen. Your years. audience ages with you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so what we found is when we start a new location, there are a lot of younger people who say, I want to be a part of that. Right. But it's but we started in the neighborhoods where they're living. In the neighborhoods within a three mile radius of our Leewood location, the average age of people living here is fifty. Ah. And so but we get into parts of Kansas City where the average age might be thirty, and suddenly we're reaching a lot more of those folks too. That's why I think 
the multi-site can be really important or start a new worship service at your location that's oriented towards younger people. And then you got to figure out what you're doing in terms of putting younger people up in front of people on the stage. So we're, when we're, you know, we have pastors who are leading in worship that are in their twenties and thirties and guys like me who are almost 60. And um, where I've had a struggle with that is our choir. So our choir on Sunday morning, we're working at this, but it still looks like, you know, a choir of people in their largely 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, uh, and that's, that's part of the challenge there. But, uh, but we do find new locations reach new younger people. Yeah, new things tend to generate momentum. It's a really good point. I got to ask you, too, um, you know, this is, this is a season for you and me, and particularly if you've done something for three decades where a lot of people are like, I don't have the energy for that anymore. Now, I have lots of energy for this. Like, I love doing what I'm doing. I would love yeah. to know, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, where do you find the energy to bring, you know, because who was it who said, you know, the best thing you bring into a room, I heard Andy Stanley say this recently, is your energy. You know, you got to bring your energy. Yeah. How are you renewing or finding energy at this stage of your leadership to keep it fresh? Yeah. Sure. Well, <clears throat> I would say in terms of preaching, what I love is every, so I, I tell people I prepare every sermon series as that was a college level course on whatever I'm teaching on. So I'm constantly learning. I love to learn and that energizes me. When I learn something new, I can't wait to share it with people. And so my sermons I'll spend, you know, and this may be normal for your audience, uh, I don't know, but I'll spend about 20 hours in reading, research, preparing. I'm going to write a you know, what would be a 10 page, what well, actually starts off as a 15 page uh, college or seminary level course paper on whatever I'm doing and then turn that into a sermon. And so that energizes me. I love people and I still love hearing people's stories. And one of the things that, you know, I don't get to the hospitals. We have a team of pastors and they're visit the hospitals, but I still get to the hospitals. I make myself go to the hospital because I need that. Uh, I need to be with people who are sick or I need to be with people who are you know, struggling. I, I, uh, we have enough pastors to do all the funerals, but I'll do a number of the funerals every year because I, that energizes me. It energizes me on Sunday just to be around people. So a lot of pastors are introverts and that's a surprise to many people, but a lot of pastors are introverts. They're drawn to the spiritual interior life. Um, and I'm, I'm a borderline introvert extrovert, but, but I'm really energized by being with people. And so on Sunday morning, I'm going to be out talk, shaking as many hands as I can, talking as many people as I can. I actually, on Sunday after church, I walk out during the benediction, the sort of closing prayer of the service. I walk out while their heads are bowed so I can beat them outside. And if I see somebody beating me, I run after them to chase them down in the parking lot. I did this, I do this every Sunday, run after people just to say, and often I find the people who, are, who went out early when I say, how are you doing today? And they're like, I'm okay. And so we have this ministry moment in the, in the parking lot for five minutes with somebody but when I'm done with that, I feel energized by it. I feel like that's what I got into this for, was to care about people and to um, try to embody the love of Christ for people. And so that stuff energizes me. I get energized by thinking about how we can impact the world. I was just, right before coming here, I was, um, I was at a health, uh, community health center here in Kansas City. And we're getting ready to buy a dental, mobile dental clinic for them with uh, part of our Christmas Eve offering. It's a, it's a half a million dollar deal. It's a, and I'm, I'm there with their, you know, their head of dental work and the woman who oversees all of their hygienists. And I mean, I came away from that, like, how cool is this? We get to do this. You know, this is really awesome. So that's at the best. And there's a lot of times where I just feel tired yeah. and I feel more tired now. I'm still working six days a week and, you know, a lot of hours, but. I'm tired and I also get easily distracted. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a, uh, but so I also, you know, I, my aim is to take, make sure I have time. The church gives me a couple of weeks off to read and study and write every year. Uh, I've got vacation time taking your sabbatical. If you're a pastor, you should have a sabbatical policy at your yeah. church, which pays for your salary while you're on sabbatical, doing something that will enhance your ministry, not just going to goof off somewhere, but, you know, studying something you've always wanted to study, you know, but somehow having time away to, and so for me, that's every summer I get some time at the Lake of the Ozarks. It's, um, you know, it's traveling and all of those things help feed my soul um, and keep me energized. But I am certainly, I get, I used to be able to stay up till two or three in the morning working. And if I have a night 
if that happens, I'm exhausted for the next two or three days. And, you know, it's just, it's different. Your body is just different at I've become a sleep evangelist since I burned out almost 20 years ago. And <laughs> exactly. my wife sometimes is like, really, you want to go to bed at 930? I'm like, yeah, but then I feel great the next day. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. I get it. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you've already touched on this a yeah. couple of different times, but I do want to ask you, your denomination has been through some major division, trauma, crisis, largely, but not exclusively over LGBTQ over the last few years. You've chosen to stay with right. the United Methodist denomination. A lot of people have left. I would love to have field notes from you on what that has been like, what you're observing, and what you're seeing. Because we do have a lot of United Methodists listening, but then there are other people who've gone through schisms and and breakups before. Uh, What are you seeing? What are you learning? What are your field notes, Adam? Well, let me answer that, but I want to say first that what the United Methodist Church is going through now is is coming to a... uh, is coming to a denomination or to your non-denominational church somewhere down the mm. road in the future. I, th- I think this is, I have calls from Nazarenes, from sometimes Assembly of God people who are calling saying, hey, you know, um, I find myself wanting to be more inclusive than my district superintendent or than my regional body. And um, I'm getting the sense that maybe I need to be looking somewhere else to go to, to go to, to be in ministry. We have, we have folks from all different denominations who are pastors on our staff, uh, people who are deeply committed followers of Jesus, um, and they have gay kids or they have, you know, there's, there's just a number of reasons why they've come at it in a different place. And we, we will, we often say within our denomination, and I wouldn't, I'm not, uh, you know, your, 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 your listeners are going to, you know, have all different views on this. And, and what we said, by the way, is at resurrection, it's okay to hold differing views on this. We don't have to all agree about this. What we have to agree upon is we're going to love everybody who walks in the door, and we're going to understand that we are going to be a church where um, where there is the ability to interpret Scripture, because we're always interpreting Scripture. We're interpreting it, you know, the Southern Baptists are wrestling with whether yeah. women can be pastors or not. Um, you know, that's about it. That's about scriptural interpretation, how we're interpreting it. But for some, it's about scriptural authority. And so, anyhow, I do believe that the years ahead will only see this issue uh be be more upfront for more conservative um right of center churches. I think I think you're right and I think uh, that's a very important caveat and if you listen to the chatter behind the scenes uh there's a lot of diversity of opinion on a number of issues right now there is I, I've had uh I've had pastors of large churches that were more conservative come to me and say my personal views are more aligned with yours, but if I said that, yep. I would lose my job. I've heard that behind the scenes. Or, or and, I can't. Yeah. yeah. And part of yeah. deconstruction so, too, right? Yeah. As people leave, they're just, I'm not going to deal right. with this anymore. I'm just going to, I'm just going to tap out. So un- un- unfortunately, right. Right. well, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know whether we need to make that judgment, but this is coming. Yeah. Yeah. This is a wider wave. It, it's, it's coming. So you can't, you can't just pretend like it's somebody else's issue. In the United Methodist Church, we have, so we have 30,000 churches uh, in 2019 yeah. in the United States. And uh, today we have 23,000 churches and 23, uh, right around 23,000, maybe 22,500, something like that. I think there's 7,300 churches yeah. that have left. And and the timeline for leaving was through right. the end of this year. And, and we're recording this uh, at the end of 2023, so I, just so people know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. We, so, we, we exactly. broadcast these much later. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we've lost 7,350 churches, I think. A large number of those were little churches, uh, but there were a few that were really large churches as well. And it's interesting to, to look at, you know, to watch and see what's happened there. For, for us, we felt, and I told, so when this all began, now there's been divisions in our church forever. I mean, we've always had a left and a right and a, a broad center. So Methodism is marked by this broad center and people lean left or lean right, and then we have the farther ends of that of that spectrum, and um, and so there's always been divisions. And what we had said up front, so four years ago, three four years ago, I met with our executive team after our our general conference is where yeah. we make key decisions for the denomination. And after our general conference in let's either 2016 or 2019, it might have been 2019, I came back and some of our staff were like, "Hey, let's just leave." Like they they voted to make. They voted to make things even harsher at that general conference for LGBTQ people and churches that would be mm-hmm. affirming of them. And, uh, 
And they're like, we don't need the denomination. And no, you could become independent. The denomination. We could easily become independent. We'd have total freedom to start locations wherever we wanted to. We would have, we currently uh, will give this coming year $3 million to denominational mm. missions and ministries outside of our church just through the denomination. So we're the largest source of income for that uh, in the in the denomination. And uh, and I, I mean, I, I broke down and wept and I said, guys, God called yeah. us to be here with this group of people. And not because they were perfect. But God called us to be here because, and and I want to remind you, Jesus said, too much is given, much more is expected. So, you know, we're staying because, A, we believe in the theology. I well, I was talking about the Book of Discipline earlier. When I got to the theological statement, past the historical statement, the theology of the United Methodist Church is not only sound, it's one of the most beautiful theological statements that I've read in any denomination. I'm very proud of what we believe. Not everybody understands it. Not everybody embraces it. Some people maybe don't. But you know, so I'm like, and I believe in this, I believe in the idea of the connection of churches Mm -hmm. being connected together and doing more together and being better together than we are apart. And we benefit from that, but we also benefit other people from that. So, you know, it was clear, we're going to stay and we're going to provide positive, good leadership. What tends to happen in a divorce, which is, this is what was happening is a divorce was happening in our, in our denomination. And what happens in a divorce is it's easy to start thinking the worst of the other side and saying bad things about them. This is why I love conversations like this, because a lot of people listening will not have your viewpoint on this issue or would have made different decisions. And I think it's really important to realize that there are thoughtful, faithful people on multiple sides of an issue. I think that's exactly right. And so, you know, for us to be able to, I said, you know, what I'd like us to do is during this divorce, I'd like for us to try our best to think the best of people who leave. I want us to, um, but I also want us to be able to correct misinformation when there's information we don't think is accurate. And so we spent a lot of time trying to do that. And then just reminding people, and I find this is true, even if you're a pastor of an independent church and you go to serve a church, most churches have forgotten what's special about them. You know, most churches have low self-esteem. They aren't sure why Mm. anybody would want to come to their church. And part of the task of a leader is to remind people this is, and it may not even be true yet, but you're going to try to tell them, this is what I love about you until they finally start to actually live up to your expectations and the thing that you praise them for. And, and I think for, you know, for me, I look at these, okay, there's 23,000 churches left in this denomination and I want to see them be as healthy and alive as possible. And I think, uh, there, I think we will, we will lose another 8,000 churches just because they're little churches that are going to die at some point. There's a lot of churches that are going to continue to decline. But I think when we get 10 years down the road, five years down the road, even now, I think we are going to be a healthier church. But again, I think, I, I know pastors who've left the denomination, some on the right and some on the left, and because it's it's really alluring, the idea of being independent, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of great independent churches out there. But there's also something powerful about being in connection with all these other people. And Again, you know, when we show up in Malawi, the United Methodist Church is already there when we show up to, to get involved and to be engaged. When, we, when we're looking for pastors, there's already a process for vetting pastors that, you know, looks at their psychological profiles, their theological profiles, their, their giftedness. That we're not having to reinvent all of that when there's a, you know, I just think there's so many things that, are, that, uh, that I want to embrace as positive um, for those United Methodist Churches to say there's a lot of re- good reasons why you don't want to leave and why you'd want to be a part of this together. And, uh, but I think the leading churches need to model that for people. You know, we need to be able to show people this is, this is what's good and beautiful about this. And let's, let's be the best we can at this. And that's always been a part of our vision here. So I don't know if that's- And I imagine that in the Church of the Resurrection that you lead, you have people with differing views over issues like LGBTQ, Absolutely. people from different sides of the aisle when election comes around, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yep. How, do you, how do you manage that tension as a pastor? Yeah. So I preach into this a lot. In fact, last Sunday's sermon mm-hmm. was, uh, I was speaking about this, but, uh, and just on the LGBTQ question, we surveyed our congregation. And of course, there's been a huge shift in our congregation over the last 20 years, just like there has been in sure. society. But for our congregation, I I had people saying, Adam, you're, you know, you don't understand the silent majority is against you, you know, about this. The silent majority sees it differently. I'm like, well, let's find out. 
And so we did a poll uh, in an all-church gathering. We had 1,600 of our people there for a, a Monday night meeting just to say, you know, we're going to talk about this and where the denomination is going. And, and uh, I'm committed to being a church for people who are more traditional on marriage and people who are more inclusive on marriage. And so, uh, but let's see where you're at. And we surveyed the people and it was, I'm making this up, but it's not far off from this. I had 3% of the people who were progressive and said, I'm going to leave. I, I, don't, I can't stay in a church where everybody doesn't hold the same view that I hold. That was 3%. Mm. I had 3% who said, I'm traditional on marriage and I can't stay in a church that's not going to hold my view of, uh, you know, not uphold my view. Then we had, so that's 6%. Then we had 73% who said, I'm more progressive on marriage, but I understand why my friends have more traditional views and I want to be in a church with them. And 23% of our people said, I'm more traditional on marriage, but I understand why some are more progressive and I want to be in a church with them. And so what we found was that 90 some percent of the people said, I'm okay being in a church with people are different. Just don't make me hold that view. But if you're willing to show respect towards me, I can show respect towards you. And we can recognize that, that maybe this is about how we're interpreting scripture and we both love Jesus. And so that was a, you know, and that was a surprise for a lot of our traditionalists who were like, oh, I didn't realize I'm actually in the minority here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. but the majority want me to be in the church with them. And so we said, you can be traditional or you can be progressive, but you got to commit to love people. You're going to have people in your small group or gay couples or, you know, whatever you're going to be, you got to know how to love them. And you can still have a view that's different, but you got to share that with love and grace and recognize that that's not maybe where everybody else is here at the church. Now that's, you know, unusual for in the United Methodist Church, it may be more 50-50 in a lot of churches. And the churches that left were churches where two thirds of the people said, no, we're more traditional and we're not sure we can stay in a church where, uh, yeah. you know, where there's a different view on that. But, uh, but when it comes to politics, we, inter we, inter we surveyed our con congregation anonymously, uh, um, survey monkey probably five years ago. And we found, uh, this is while Trump was president. We found that 40% of our people identified as Republicans, 40% as Democrats and 20% as independents. So it's interesting, you know, you're talking about preaching. You're reaching the community. Exactly. And, uh, and so, uh, and if you're reaching non-religious and nominally religious people, you're going to be reaching more Democrats. And so, because just statistically, mm. more non-religious yes. and nominally religious people are Democrats. And, yeah, and that's actually true. Mm -hmm. And so if you really want to reach them, you got to figure out how do I do that? Because if you're, if they come to church and feel like they're hearing a Republican rally, they're not coming back. That's just not, that's not going to cut it. So it works if your church is large, if, if all you want to reach is in the United States, the, the red crowd, you're probably going to be fine. But if you're, if you're serious about reaching, you know, so, so we talk about diverse this. Crowd. Yeah. yeah. We, one of the things we did, uh, and I'm very excited about this. So in 2019, we set a 10 year vision for the church. No, nobody sets 10 year visions, you know, anymore. You say a one year vision is probably as far as you can go. We said, I said, I got 10 years left. From 2030 to 2040, I got 10 years left. Or I'm sorry, from 2020 to 2030, I'd like for us to take on some things that that require 10 years to get them done. And so <laughs> we began, and and we had we set up four, uh, you know, we went through. It was almost like a capital campaign. A whole we had consultants coming in, interviewing people. We we interviewed civic leaders in Kansas City. We wanted to know where are the problems in Kansas City that need to be addressed. What are the you know who are we as a church? And anyhow, we. Um, one of those things had to do with, with healing the polarization in Kansas City. And so we said, and not just in Kansas City, but across the country to the degree that we could. So we began looking at every two years, starting in 2020, we will have our own election campaign. And we have uh, yard signs, we have campaign buttons, we have television spots, radio spots, billboards. I preach into it. We have gatherings built around this. And they're always about depolarizing our community. So, and we're going to take a theme that is clear in scripture that Republicans and Democrats who ha are people of faith would all agree this is an important idea. And so the first one was love your neighbor. It was hashtag love your neighbor. And we, uh, you know, we had about 5,000 yard signs out and we, you know, we did, I preached into it right before the presidential election in 2020 and throughout the year talking about why it's important that we listen to each other. We walk in each other's shoes. Here's how we do that. Let me model that for you. Small group participation with people who view things differently, activities that we did together. Then two years later in 2022, we, we had a campaign that was the B campaign, be just, be kind, be humble, uh, based on Micah 6, 8. And so again, 
you know, now we're going to actually live this in the community. This time around in 2024, it's uh, the Do Unto Others campaign. And the logo is a heart where the sort of upper lobe of the heart on one side is Republican red and on the other side is Democratic blue. And then it becomes purple below and it's Do Unto Others. And we're just going to talk about what does it look like? Jesus said that the law and the prophets hinge on this one idea, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So how are we going to do that as followers of Jesus? And Anyway, our people are pretty excited about it. We're, we've got hundreds of other churches joining us. We're providing materials for them. And, and uh, uh, But what happens if the church becomes known as the entity that's trying to bring people together as opposed to the church becoming the wedge in the culture wars? And again, for unchurched people, that sounds like the kind of church they want to be a part of, not the culture warriors that, are, uh, that they've come to associate with Christianity, and in particular, often, unfortunately, evangelical Christianity. I think I can see where your energy comes from. You just gave us a sneak peek. Those are bold visions, Adam. You said something interesting in the statistics, and I want to make sure I got it right. So when you polled your congregation, 1,600 people, 3% on the progressive left said, I can't be in a church with people who don't think the way I think. And about 3% on the right, who'd hold very traditional views, would say, I can't be in a church that doesn't agree with everything I say on this issue. That's 6%. Interesting. And those are the people who send you emails. Those are the people who stop you in the hallway. Those are the people. And Chris Bale, who's on this podcast two years ago, I quote it a lot because it just keeps showing up. It's 6% who generates 73% of the division in social media. And it sounds like 6% of the people who are like, I can't live with anybody who's not like me in your church. It's just fascinating how that number, and I, I share that to underline for leaders who are in the line of fire, you're probably hearing, I mean, when I wrote Leading Change Without Losing It, I'm like, do the math. There's always about 10% of people, less than 10%, who are opposed to the change you're leading. And probably of that 6%, you might hear from 10% of the 6%, right? It's not like you're hearing from all 6%. What would that be? That would be like... Uh, a yeah, lot of people. I mean, if you think 20,000 members, you're, you'd be hearing from scads of, you know, even at, even at 10% of the 3%. But yeah, I think you're exactly right that, that, but it's hard to remember that when you have a nasty email or it's, and again, yeah. at 59, it's easier for me, but yeah. it's hard to remember that when you get a letter from somebody saying, I'm leaving the church because I think you are, uh, you are misleading people and you are a false prophet or you are a uh, wolf right. in sheep's clothing or whatever. And those things tend to be like daggers to your soul. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then what, what happens is hopefully you don't change your views. You just learn to be quiet and don't say anything. And so this is what I find. And you have to be careful how you say what you say. You know, if you're, uh, what I say to folks, to pastors is when it comes to prophetic preaching, you can either merely irritate people or you can influence them. It's easy to irritate people. It takes no skill. You just get up and blast away with whatever you think is, you know, God's will for the world in terms of some social issue. If you really want to influence people, you have to understand why somebody holds a view different than your own. You have to be able to acknowledge that with grace. You have to be able to talk about, you know, why you might hold the views that you do that are different, that you hope that they might adopt. And you have to be able to say, and I could be wrong about this. And I think if you're able to do that, you have a chance of actually influencing people to change. And uh, so, again, unfortunately, when our feelings get hurt or we have people leaving a stink and, you know, at Resurrection, so we got 20 some thousand members, but we've lost over the last 20 years, we've had to have lost 2000 members at least. And we've gained over those years, 10,000 members yeah. or whatever. But, but when you lose them and people that you loved and people that you were friends and you were in small group with, or they don't feel like they, you know, they... They leave poorly or they, you know, they say mean things about you that hurt your feelings. It can, it can be easy to go, you know what? I just won't say anything hard anymore. I will not say anything that anybody's going to get upset about. And uh, I remind people, uh, one of my favorite verses in scripture is John 6, 66. And uh, so 666 is a good kind of mnemonic to remember. John yes, 6, yes. 666, Jesus had just said, uh, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never go hungry. Uh, whoever drinks of me will never thirst again. And John 66, 66 says something to the effect of, and many people left him at that point. And I'm like, this is Jesus. And many people left him. And then he, the disciples, you know, disciples come to me, says, are you going to leave me too? And you can almost feel the pain. He's a 33-year-old, you know, 
itinerant preacher. Yes, he's the son of God, but he's also human. And how much that must have hurt to have all those people leave. And and then I, I think it's really interesting uh, in, the, in the Synoptic Gospels where they say that he has a demon. And it's by the prince mm. of demons that Jesus is saying and doing these things. Can you imagine how hurtful that must have been to be the son of God, healing people? I mean, all he's trying to do is heal broken people and help them and open the eyes of the blind. And they say, you have a demon. What you're doing is because the prince of demons. And I'm like, you know, so Jesus knew what it was like to have this happen. And what makes you special that you're not going to have this happen to you? You know, of course it's going to happen. But the question is, do you give up or do you persevere? And uh, I think it's easy for us to give up because it just hurts as opposed to persevering. And, you know, you learn from it. You just mentioned this earlier. I, every time we have a, you know, when we've had only a couple of times that we had mass numbers of people leave, but I try to learn from that. Like, what did I, did I say something? Could I have said it differently? And almost always it's probably true. I could have said something and I try really hard at this. But could I have said that a little bit differently? Could I, have, could I have seen them change their views instead of leave and go find a church that reinforces their views? And often, yes, there's things I could do better and things that I, I wished I had said it slightly differently or done. But sometimes it's like, no, I don't think I could. In fact, if anything, I think, and I told the congregation this once, we were having conversations around uh, universal health care and Obamacare. And um, I brought in a panel of speakers from both sides of this and we did this on abortion earlier uh, last year. We had a great mm -hmm. panel. I went and interviewed the head of Planned Parenthood and went to their offices, never been to Planned Parenthood office. Then I went to a, wow. you know, a, a group that was aiming to convince people not to have abortions right across the street from the Planned Parenthood and, and uh, you know, spent time, you know, inviting a panel of experts and, and sharing, you know, at the end, letting it be centered on women's voices. But at the end, I shared some things too. And uh, so I find it's really helpful when people you can hear both sides of something, earnest, thoughtful people. And you go, okay, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand how they got there. And they've given me something to think about here. Um, now I've lost my train of thought, but I, I just think it's no. important for us to, to recognize if you want to influence people, it's usually not by slamming people. It's not by becoming a culture warrior. And in the end, I think, I think the culture war in America has done more to hurt the Christian faith and the cause of Christ and the kingdom of God than, than most other things I can think of in the last 30 years. Because the culture war has turned a whole group of people to think, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want it. Well, and we've fallen prey to it as opposed to paving another way. Um, this has been so helpful, Adam. Are there any other field notes? You know, I, I'm I mean, sure there are, but I think that's I think that's all I've got. I, but that, that's a, that's enough for now. That's enough for now. I think it's a very different paradigm, and I'm really grateful you shared it, uh, Adam. Any other final thoughts generally before we wrap up? Anything that I didn't ask you that you wished I would have asked you, or anything you didn't get to say that you wished you could have said? Oh, probably. But right now, my right now, I'm just thinking. I've enjoyed the conversation with you, Carrie, and appreciate you and your heart for wanting to help churches and uh, yeah. pastors and leaders. I think it's really important. People need encouragement. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you, you seek to be one of those Barnabases, one of those sons of encouragement of what you're doing. And, um, and I think people need information too. And I, I think both what you've done in terms of encouraging people to think outside the box, using technology as a way of connecting with people. And that, that if people are worshiping online, that still counts. You know, there's yeah, yeah, there's it still does. there's still a part of your community, well. and uh, but also your you know your ability to give people information that helps them make wise decisions or think differently about what they're doing because it's easy for us I think to get into neutral and we just keep doing the same things we've always been doing because and I find yeah. this I, I find it less today but there was a period in my 40s where I thought I'm too tired to try to change anything. I don't feel that way today. It's funny. In my late fifties, I feel kind of Isn't energized. Isn't that interesting? But, yeah, but in my okay. 40s, well, yeah. did you tweak anything? Did you change anything? What did you do? Or you just stuck well, it out and boom, there's the energy again. You know, I did. I think it did. It was a several year period of time, and I think part of it was capital campaign after capital campaign after oh, capital yeah. campaign, coupled with social issues that divided people, coupled with um, working, you know, sixty five hours a week forever and mm. not taking enough time away. It just left me weary. I, f I just remember thinking brain tired and somebody, there'd be like something we need to do. And I'm like, I can't do it right now. I can't do one more thing. Yeah. And then somewhere, you know, living through that, don't give up in the middle of that, but maybe you needed to figure out how to take more time away. And I was writing two books a year and that was, that was 
too many, you know, there's just a lot of stuff. So I had to adjust some things in my life. And I also had to let go of feeling like I had to be in charge of everything. And, uh, you know, today, Church of the Resurrection, our, our staff run the church. I, I am, I, I think I'm the keeper of the DNA at the highest level. I'm the chief communicator. I'm the chief fundraiser when it comes to just making the ask. Yeah. Um, I represent the church in the Kansas City area and in the community. And they bring important decisions to me so that I get to weigh in still. And, uh, but, you know, our, our people, our staff and our lay volunteers, uh, our lay servants are, you know, they, they pretty much run the church. And if I stepped away, the church would run fine. The key would be making sure that they felt that the, you know, that whoever took over as the senior leader, um, you know, that they, they felt good about their preaching and everything else. But, um, that helped. I think when I, when I got to that point, then I, I felt like I was able to sort of refine myself again. So there was a period of about three years where I felt like, man, I'm just so tired and I can't even think about trying to change anything. Mm. And I think a lot of churches get to that point yeah. and a lot of pastors get to that point. And, uh, and you got to come out of that because that'll be a death spiral if you're, if you don't. Well, you just dropped so much insight quickly in three minutes. It might be a good setup for around three down the road. So Adam, cool. we'll leave it there, but thank you so much. So tell us where people, you've written over 30 books. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, so people can find out you, if you just search Amazon uh, yeah. for Adam Hamilton, books by Adam right. Hamilton, you'll find uh, most of them are on there. All of them are on there, but also uh, adamhamilton.com is uh, a website where I was uh, blogging. And now I, I don't do it quite as much. I just have found my time's gone other places, but all of my books, resources, videos are there. Uh, COR for Church of Resurrection. So core.org and uh, at core.org, you can see our website. You can find all of our past sermons, um, you know, resources, other things. We do a leadership institute every fall, yeah. the last weekend of September. And we always have great speakers. Carrie, you were, you were one of those this last year. Thank and, you. Uh, and our goal is to open the hood on Church of the Resurrection and to allow just to give away everything we've learned and the, the mistakes we've made and to figure out how to lead people inspired and encouraged and equipped when they leave. And, and it's uh, the, I think it's the largest mainline leadership conference that happens every year. And um, so anyway, that's, those wow. are a few things. I'm, I'm on uh, Facebook. I go live every Tuesday night uh, from about 7.30 central time to about 8.15, just whatever's on my mind that day for, uh, you know, for around faith or life. Uh, YouTube, we have a YouTube channel uh, for Church of the Resurrection. You can find all my stuff there. And, uh, and we're also on Instagram and on, uh, on Twitter. So wow. you're everywhere. Adam. Hey, this has been a very, very helpful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carrie. Great to be with you today.